This episode is brought to you by Move Meditate Sleep, an all-in-one platform to help you move more freely, meditate more easily, and sleep more soundly, with new content added every week. If you'd like to try a free seven-day trial, click the link in the pinned comment. I'll start. Shane Lennon. Cameron Actor, <laughs> teacher, <laughs> philanthropist. <laughs> um, how are you keeping? I'm really good, yeah. Thank you for coming, man. Uh-huh, thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, yeah. Our, um, our relationship started three weeks ago. We went, yeah. we went for a coffee. Yeah, we went for a coffee. <laughs> uh, I was just saying how like uh, you don't really meet people that much. It, not just in the time we are now, but in this profession, you know, of being a yoga teacher, I find. Yeah, it for me, I, my my like very short career as a yoga teacher so far uh, has very much been online. So I have definitely not met a lot of people or a lot of teachers. I mean, the teachers that I know or the teachers that I practice with before I did my teacher training, um, who've kind of become my friends now, you know. And but like outside of that, no, I definitely don't meet a lot of people, mm. yoga people, you know. Um, my friends are definitely not into yoga. Um, <laughs> uh, some of them, some of them definitely give it a go, you know. Um, but it was definitely not in my circle for a long time. Mm. Um, I think, I think a lot of my friends will look at me doing yoga now and kind of think, oh, okay, you know, maybe. Um, yeah. But I don't think it's. It's not really a. It's not a male focused thing, really, is it? I mean. Mm. I mean, I, I definitely think it's shifting that way. Um, I was, I mean, how was I was introduced to yoga through acting school? I definitely didn't seek out yoga, um, so I didn't like run into a studio. Or, how did uh, they, how did they introduce it to you in acting? So it's very much part of an acting um, curriculum. So movement, yoga, voice work, breathing. Everything that's really in yoga is is in an acting degree, mm. um, and I hated it. Like absolutely, just was not for me. Um, my background is going to the gym, lifting weights. Um, you know, trying to build myself physically strong so that I could then tell myself that I'm mentally strong. Um, and then when I had to stretch that out or when I had to move my muscles in a different way, it just was extremely uncomfortable for me. And where I was at in my life at the time, I didn't want to deal with any uncomfortable situations. Uh, I was very much, you know, I'll stick to lifting weights. Thank you very much. Mm. Uh, my movement teacher was like, mate, if you want to be an actor, you, you know, you need to be able to move your body properly. And right now you're just like a, a walking block. So, you know, you need to free up a bit. And I didn't really want to hear it. Uh, I've put you stuck with me for like mm. a long time, uh, probably a year. I think it took over a year for me to eventually just let my shoulders drop and just relax, you know, and just go, okay, just trust somebody else's opinion here. Um, so that was a very difficult year, um, mentally, physically. Um, but then, yeah, once I let go, things started to open up and it was a huge shift, like a huge shift, you know? Why did your teacher suggest then that you should relax and that sounds si- silly the reason why i ask, ask this is i thought about being a younger man and and building muscle and i recently thought that it was kind of like a suit of armor where if i look like the more manly i look the more i feel like i can identify with being a man <laughs> and uh when I was first started exercising, I was like 26 and I went to the gym, um, raw gym here in Dublin. And I remember sitting in the gym on the bench and I was sitting next to actually his, his former Mr. Universe, Tony something, Irish guy, but just so happened. I'm looking at him, looking at me, looking at him, looking at me again. <clears throat> this is, <clears throat> this is Mr. Universe. So he has got the title of being the greatest man in the universe. And when you're a kid, especially at my age, like almost 40, he man is the ultimate man. Listen to his name. This is before, way before pronouns. He man, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so that's like the manliest man you can, there can be in the universe, not just the world. Yeah. So I would sit on there on the bench and I'd walk out to the gym floor, walk around a few bench presses, whatever, walk back to the change room. I couldn't bring myself to actually 
sit down and try and lift the weight because I felt so like an imposter. I thought I'm too skinny. I, I started wearing like long sleeve shirts and stuff in the gym because I was so paranoid about my arms and whatever. Yeah. Um, but my point is, what is my point, Shane? My point is, <laughs> um, the gym building ourselves up, building yourself uh, up. Yeah. So like your white. teacher said yeah. you need to relax. Yeah. Why? Because you you said it there, like the suit of armor, and and that's what it was for me. Uh, I have a background in addiction, uh, so as soon as I stopped using drugs and alcohol, I needed something else. I needed to, you know, like that was my my escape. And then I didn't have an escape anymore. And then somebody introduced me to the gym, and then I started going to the gym. And then I was like, right, okay, if I can build myself up here, and if I look okay out here then I'll be okay in here. Or then everybody will think that I'm okay in here. Little did I know at the time, you know, by trying to expose and build up all of this out here, it just for me means there's something else going on inside. You know what I mean? I'm trying to hide something else. I'm trying to mask something else. Um, so that's what I was doing. I was masking that. That was my, my external, bar my external uh, suit of armor to look and big and, and feel strong in myself. Um, and that was my coping mechanism. So, and that was okay. There was nothing wrong with that. Um, but as soon as somebody tried to break down my coping mechanism, then I just, I was like panic. You know what I mean? I'm like, no, 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 hold on a second. I've been broken down in a treatment center before. I built myself back up and now I'm okay. So don't, don't break me back down again. Mm. I was afraid to go back there. Um, and as soon as I did get broken, uh, you know, and, and I say that word broken down, like I wasn't like broken down, you know what I mean? But it was somebody was trying to help me to let go, release, have a deeper look inside myself and try to understand a little bit more. And my yoga teacher or my, my movement teacher um, was really like put a, just so much time into me. Um, Sue Maiden is her name. She, like we argued so much like so much i was like I, I i didn't even like her for the first year and now we're good friends you know <laughs> um and the fact that i'm a yoga teacher now like even the people that were in my class in in college like a lot of them laugh and go like how did you end up being a yoga teacher <laughs> um because i didn't understand it you know and i asked the questions what is it about what am i doing here what am i trying to do um and i don't know if i got the clearest of answers at the time um because it was just sore you know it wasn't nice um and then and then i left uh acting school and i didn't really follow up on yoga didn't really follow up on movement much and then i got an injury in my back and i was like oh yeah that yoga thing kind of helped me free up a little bit and then went back into a studio hot studio like sweat pouring off me closer to a gym than than a yoga class um, so that kind of, I could relate to that a little bit more. It was nice and fast. It was paced. And I was like, yeah, this, this I'm into sweat pouring off me, got to work out. And then slowly over time, I just started to explore different areas of yoga and slowing it down. And, and very much now my, my practice is a little bit slower. I take much more time to explore what's going on in a pose. Um, and yeah, and then I fell in love and I remember just sitting up inside in a class one day and going, I found myself teaching classes in my head at home when I was doing a practice. You know what I mean? I was like, how would I explain that now? And how would mm. I? And I just felt that was naturally coming. And then I remember sitting up in a class and kind of thinking, I could think I could give this a go teaching. Um, I was walking through the corridor in Yoga Hub and bumped into Susie. How are we getting on? I was like, I was actually thinking about that teacher training thing. And she was like, all right. And next day I got an email, you know, mm. are you interested? You know, do you want to sign up? And, um, and, yeah, and then I I very much, if I, if, if I want to do something, I just kind of do it. Do you know what I mean? And I was like, yeah, fuck it, I'll do it. Um, so I just signed up and ended up teaching. And then halfway through, I was like, oh, I don't know if I actually want to teach this. The thoughts of standing up in a classroom and teaching somebody, I was like, oh, my God. Like, I think halfway through, um, Brian Malone was the teacher trainer, and he was like, you need to start thinking about your, your sequence and teaching your sequence. And I was like, oh, my God, the anxiety in my stomach. I was like, I don't want to teach anyone. You know, and a lot of that is the fear of like, what if I'm not good enough? You know what? Like, because in my head, I was the best yoga teacher. I was the best, like standing in my kitchen on my own 
I was the best yoga teacher in in the world. You know, <laughs> you know, I was telling, you know, could sequence a class, I could talk through a class, put somebody in front of me, and like, you know, collapse. I think an element of being an effective yoga teacher in a group is obviously being willing to be a, a sort of a performer because people are there to for an experience. But the difference is, you, being an actor you're pretending to be someone else. Whereas I think being a good yoga teacher, you're trying to convey yourself as best you can. And that's probably where the challenge came from, I'm assuming. Yes, very much so. Um, yeah, you just said it there, like standing on a stage, you're a character. You know, I'm not Shane standing on a stage. Standing in a yoga room, you're Shane. Like you often see people kind of saying, oh, like actors being really nervous doing speeches and stuff because they're standing up there being themselves and people mm. aren't used to seeing them as being themselves. Um, remember, I think it was like a wedding or a funeral or something like, oh, Shane will go up and do a reading there. So he's an actor. And then standing up on the thing with the thing and, and messing up all the lines and like being so nervous. Um, and then, and even here, like I'm quite nervous now, you know mm. what I mean? Like, and I'm used to having cameras around. I'm used to having a mic in front of me for self tapes and stuff like that. But I'm being somebody else in front of the camera. Now, now with Shane, it's very much more exposed. So that is that's much harder. Um, so you, you mentioned sorry, Shane, but, um, you mentioned about addiction. Plenty of people, including me, have taken drugs recreationally, had a great time with them, and you just say enough is enough. Um, I'm going to stop. Why did you become addicted? Because they're so good, <laughs> you know, like, and that's the reality. They were just like, like, I'll never forget my first time taking an ecstasy tablet. You know what I mean? I'll, I'll, like, it was just, and, and I rem like, I, you know, like, it's, it's hard, like, it's, it's difficult to say that I was an addict from the day I took, you know, my first tablet. But I remember taking my first ecstasy tablet and thinking, I want the rest of my life to feel like this. I want to be here. Because down here ain't good enough. You know what I mean? There's just there's something going on down here that I'm not happy with. So I want to be up here. Now I had a lot of like things thrown at me as a young kid. My brother died when I was really young. Like my grandfather passed away. Apparently, you know, I was quite close to my grandfather. I would have been around him quite a lot. Um, and then my brother who died was cerebral palsy. So my parents had to put an awful lot of attention on him. And my mom kind of said later on that she realized that because the attention was so focused on my younger brother that I was kind of craving that attention. You know what I mean? I was, and I think that carried on into later life, you know, that I always wanted to be the center of attention. I always wanted to be the person in the room. Um, and I think drugs kind of helped that. Um, I was very young when I started taking drugs. I hung around with an older crowd on, you know, around the streets and stuff, people in school. I always hung around with older people. And drugs got, just got introduced to me at a very young age. And and then I just got to a point where I didn't know how to stop. I tried so hard. Um, I didn't really tell anyone to the extent of my problems. Um, I remember getting drugs from people and it got to the point where I was getting drugs off different drug dealers because I didn't want my drug dealer to know how much drugs I was taking. Yeah. So I was like, and then one of my drug dealers came to the house one day to drop something off. And I was like, oh, come in, come in. And like, my parents will probably listen to this now and they'll like, but it was in my parents' house. Like they were away for a while. And I remember like the excitement of knowing that he was coming. And that was part, like that's even as much important about addiction as the actual taking of the drug. It's the getting of it and knowing that it's coming and knowing where you're going. And then I took a line while he was there and he was looking at me going, what are you doing? I was like taking a line. He was like, man, you're on your own. I was like, yeah. And he was like, come on, man. Like you can't be staying at home on your own taking lines. Like, so there was all those little kind of early indications that I was probably using more than I was using, more than I should have been using. Um, and you know, like, probably nobody should be using no but you know I, I, I don't know like alcohol is a drug as just as much a drug as any other drug mm. you know um 
and people drink every day. You know, they escape reality every day. And I don't know if there's anything wrong with that. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. People have come to me and said to me, oh, I think I might have a problem. I'm like, well, you're ready to stop right now. And they're like, no. And I'm like, well, okay, let's talk about it when you're ready to stop. Because there's no point in me having a conversation with somebody about their drinking or their drug using and somebody that might be in my circle and then they might say, oh, I think I've got a problem. And then we go out next week and they're drinking and using in my company after telling me that it's going to be very uncomfortable for them knowing what they've told me. So I just don't really have those conversations with people unless they're ready to stop right now. Um, what was the drug that tipped you over the edge or that you became most addicted to? Cocaine. Yeah, that was the one that really... And, and the first time I took cocaine, it, I was so underwhelmed. I was like, oh my God, what is the, all the talk about? Because I'd been taking ecstasy for so long and ecstasy is like, like mad crazy. Like, yes, love it. Love everyone. Like all those lovely feelings. And then I took coke and I was like, oh, this isn't like ease, like, you know? Um, and then I took it again and took it again. And I was like, oh, there must be something in here that I'm not getting. And then eventually that confidence started to come in with a couple of lines and and then I just couldn't. I just found it so hard to stop, you know? Um, and then I had this thing in my head that it was like, oh, it's much easier to stop taking ease. So I might, I might just go back and start taking ease now and I'll just stop, stop taking ease. But it was easy to stop taking ease because I started taking coke, you know? So mm. I was just transferring everything around. And then I was like, right, I need to stop taking drugs now. I'll just have a couple of drinks when I go out and I get absolutely smashed. Like just can't even remember and then wake up the next morning and gone. I've no idea what happened, but I was only drinking. So it was grand. Um, and then, and then it just all mashed in together, like cokies drinking two, three days, benders. And then the, the massive turning point then was an attempted suicide. I just couldn't, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know who to turn to. Nobody really knew the extent of it. I was very much on my own like trying my best to stop my parent my grandmother had a holiday home away so i used to kind of go and try live down there so i'd go to work from there in the morning and then i was just this moody really difficult person to be around um and people were like you're depressed and you've got you know there's issues and like i just didn't want to hear any of that stuff um and then it came to the point where i was like i can't do this anymore i've tried to stop i can't i've accepted that my life is just going to be like this it's going to be pain all the time and then i attempted a suicide and in my parents house an ambulance came and then you know i got brought to hospital was monitored for a while and then i was brought to a counselor and you know, I, I, that was the first time I opened up and just said, look, I've, I've got a huge problem. And I put my parents were like, what the fuck like, is going on here? Do you know what I mean? Like they just thought I was going out for a few drinks. I was a moody little kid. And, um, and then I went into the council and the council was like, uh, you know, now I was walking out the door, like you shared everything, opened up. I was like, oh my God, that was like, whoo, like, yes. And then. I was walking out the door and the counselor said to me, you know, no, if you use again, you can come back. You know what I mean? You, you know, you're welcome to come back. I was like, yes, I'm going to come in here every week, share all my problems and just go out and use it the weekend. You know, this is great. This is the perfect combination. So I went back out the weekend and now my parents knew I was taking drugs. Now they knew that, that the issue was there. And then I went out and took drugs that weekend. And my parents were like, oh my God. So I think my parents got some help from a counselor and the counselor was like, well, you need to push him down. You need to send him to rock bottom as quickly as possible. Now that's a very, very difficult thing for a parent to do. You know, they were like, you need to push him out. You need to stop, um, um, what's the word? It's used in addiction. I can't, it's just, I've lost it now. Um, but they weren't- Cold turkey? No. no, no, it's not cold turkey. It's just kind of like they were, they were influencing me. They were helping me in my addiction. They were giving me a bed to sleep in, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so they were, he was like, you need to take all that stuff away. You need to take everything away from him. So then my parents were like, you need to go, you need to leave the house. If you're going to be taking drugs, you need to leave the house. So me just being the stubborn guy that I was, I was like, yeah, yeah, fuck you. I'm gone. Pack my bags out the door. And then just ended up partying for a while. Um, sleeping on couches, anywhere I could get a, like, room it was a, it was a horrible time like a horrible time like you party for a couple of days and then you're sleeping in somebody else's bed that's still partying in the room you can hear the music going on you can hear the people talking 
I mean, your shoulders are going there. You feel that uncomfortability. <laughs> do you know what I mean? You know what that's like. You know, it's horrible. Like, it's a horrible place to be. And then eventually, I think it was after about three days of, like, really hard at it. I was like, this is just coming down, like, coming down hard. I actually had three pills left in my, in my sock. I was in an early house and I just took the three of them. And I was like, right. And then I was getting nothing off it. I don't know how much time had passed. It could have been like five minutes. Of course, I was getting nothing off it. And I just said, I need to leave. I walked out. I walked to the nearest garage. Pay phones were a thing at the time. I got a pay phone. <laughs> and I rang my house. And I just said, I want to come home. They said, you can come home, but you need help. You need help straight away. And if you're willing to get help, you can come home. I went home. I got to the door. I put the key in the door. And I came up in the fucking three pills. <laughs> And I wanted to go back out again because I was back. Do you know what I mean? I was like, yes, here we go. And I was like, oh, I just got to face it. You know what I mean? So I went in, walked into the thing and they looked at me. I was in a state like I'd lost loads of weight like over that weekend. And I went up to bed and I woke up the next morning. And I just went, I could hear my dad coming in the door. You know, that like the door goes, the key goes into the door. The door opens, the door closes. You can hear it in the bed. I'm like, shit. And my dad came up to the room and he was like, you, um, right, let's go. Got a counsellor sorted. You ready to go? I was like, um, he's like, yeah, did a cup of tea. We'll have a chat. Let's go down and talk to this counsellor. Went down and talked to the counsellor. Counsellor picked up the phone, handed me the phone and said, there's a treatment centre. Talk to them. You want to go in or don't you? So I was like, oh my God, this was happening way too quickly. You know what I mean? Spoke to the treatment centre. They were like, come down for an assessment. Went down for an assessment. Shared everything. Told them how many, how much drugs had been taken. And they said, right, okay, there's a bed there. Are you ready to come in? I was like, oh, no, 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 I've got, you know, I've got shit to sort. They were like, well, you can't. Your parents will get your clothes. They'll bring them down. Because if you go back out, you're not going to come back. Do you want to come in or don't you want to come in? I was like, yeah, okay. And I stayed. And I watched my parents drive out. Standing in the, the like, there's like a corner room, a place called Talbot Grove down in Kerry. Standing in that corner room and watched my parents drive out the driveway and crying like a baby like a baby like oh my god what is going on here um yeah and then spent 30 days in there had an absolute meltdown in there like put me on librium came off the librium like had meltdowns had dreams within dreams like coming off everything like like mayhem inside there but it just they just opened up a book and just said there's your life this is why you do it and it becomes this is why you do it yeah this is why you're taking drugs okay you know what I mean like you've got all these problems that are inside in your head and you don't know how to deal with them you don't know how to open up you don't know how to talk i'm what, gonna what were the problems that they outlined my brother was a lot of the stuff that came up for me um there was a lot of stuff around when he died um so we were in my grandmother's holiday home in kilkee when he died and we woke up in the morning my mom was like oh go in and check in dear and see if he's okay so i went in checked he was asleep came back out that was grand. I was like, just check him there and see if he's okay again, will you? And so I went in, he was yeah, he was still asleep, came back out. I was like, no, he's still asleep. Then a little bit more time passed. Mom was like, Jesus Christ, like he's like he doesn't sleep this long, you know? So she went in and checked on him. And then she came out and just started like like just screaming. Just screaming, like it was like, I'm gonna be back in a minute, love. I need to leave for a minute. So she ran out the front door, kinda left me in the house. I was about six or seven at the time. And I'm like in the house going, what the fuck is going on here, you know? She comes back with a priest. They go into the room. My dad's there like, like Limerick is an hour away from this place. My dad's there in like 45 minutes or something, you know, like came racing down. And then I was like, oh my God. And then, and then, whew, whew, I haven't talked about this in a while. <laughs> and he passed away. Um, I carried that for a while because I felt like I should have known that he died a bit earlier, you know? And then I went into treatment and we sat down and we talked about it. And the, the counselor said, I want you to think about a seven year old child. And if you told a seven year child to go into a bedroom and check on a child and they didn't know that the child was dead, would you blame the seven year old? And I was like, no. And they were like, so why are you blaming yourself? It's okay, like, do you know what I mean? And I was like, it's actually okay. I mean, it's not my fault. I shouldn't have known. I couldn't have known. I was just a child, you know. But I carried a bit of that for a while, you know. Um, so that was there. My daughter, I had my daughter when I was 16. 
you know, I had to become a man at 16. That was very difficult. You know, I was like, right, I need to cut out drugs. And I stopped for a while. You know what I mean? I did stop and I, I got my shit together. I, you know, I started working. Failed my leaving cert. It was terrible. My, you know, I was terrible in school. Um, and my daughter was born. Leaving cert starts on a Wednesday. Did an exam Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And my daughter was born on Sunday. And, you know, and her mom did the leaving cert on Monday morning. They brought an assessor into the hospital and her mom stuck and did her leaving cert in the hospital bed after having a baby. Um, you know, amazing. Like, I couldn't have given a shit about the exams. Do you know what I mean? I was down the pub that Sunday night drinking with the lads. Here we go. And my dad thought it was cool coming into school. Everyone clapping. Yay, Shane's the man. Like all that stuff um but then i was like right i need to get my shit together and then i got my shit together and then i think i got to around 18 or 19 and i was like i've missed out on a couple of years here of just being a teenager because i had to be a dad and i think that's when i kind of started drifting back into drugs and there was like a lot of pressure on at that stage now don't get me wrong i had a lot of help like my parents her parents were just amazing like you know so supportive of both of us um so we had a lot of support around us and but you know i carried a lot of that stuff and then i felt like i need i need a bit of a blowout here i need a blowout because i've been a dad for two two years now um and and i blew out big <laughs> um yeah and then yeah and then I, I was off everything for a year and a half and after the treatment center after the treatment center yeah about a year and a half went away on a holiday for a, uh, a bit of time on my own subconsciously probably thinking i'm gonna stay there and drink for a couple of months and i did you know i thought everything was okay got my shit together i'm a year and a half in my head's good you know i'm in a good space you know i've built up these nice relationships with my parents with my daughter's mom with her family everything was you know pretty good had a beer in, in crete in on holidays and and then it just, you know, it spiraled. It took about nine months to get back to where, where I was at. It was slow enough. I tried to control it for a very long time, you know. So, so th th 30 days in the treatment center, then a year and a half, nothing. And yeah. then you went to, went away, had a beer, and then it took you nine months to, to, get, to get back, yeah. From one beer. Yeah, just one beer. And one beer, like two beers, you know, not going to drink this weekend. You know, I'm, I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not an addict. I'm not going to drink. And then the following week, I might have three beers and then three beers, four beers, five beers. And then, you know, oh, oh, there's a line. I'll take one. I'll just take a line. Like, I'm not going to buy anything, but I'll take one of your lines. And then you take a line and then, you know, before you know it, you're fucking buying and selling and, you know, anything you can do. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, I was back to square one again. I went into my mom, walked into the room. I was like, uh, so I'm back taking drugs. It's just, you don't need to sell me, love. You know, I'm not fucking stupid, you know. Um, I said I need help, so I didn't go back to the treatment center. I went back to some meetings, NA, NA, um, and the next six months was very hard because now I'm doing it for me. You know, I, for the first time round, it was kind of like you know, family are real proud of me. You know, Shane's doing great, loved that. You know, I was you know a bit of attention. You know, I don't drink, I'm off the drink. You know, um, and then next time round, no one gives a shit. Do you know what I mean? I'm back off the drink again. Oh, I don't care. You were off it before. You went back on it. You know what I mean? I didn't. Ha I didn't have to prove myself to anybody. I was doing it for me now, and that was hard. For six months, going into meetings, this is shit. I don't want to do it. You know what I mean? And then a guy stopped me after a meeting one day and was like, "Mate, if you want to drink, drink." You know I mean like take drugs if you want to take drugs? You have the choice here. You can do it if you want to do it. And I was like, right, okay, and that sunk with me. You know what I mean? I was like, I do have the choice here. And he was like, because if you want to get sober, get sober. You know? And do the work. You know I mean? Do the steps. Get stuck in. Because that's the only way you're going to change. If you keep telling, coming in and telling yourself your life is shit and, you know, you can't drink, then you're going to live your life like that. Maybe you're going to turn around and say, "For I choose today not to drink. And my life's going to be better for that reason. And that's what I started to do. Um, and that changed me. And I don't even know who that person was, but that person made a huge difference in my life. They don't even know it. I, I can't even remember who it was because there were so many faces in meetings and stuff. It was just one guy called me out one day and it made a huge difference. Now, it could have been, it could have went the complete opposite. I could have went, yeah, fuck this, I'm going to drink it. But, you know. He, I suppose you heard it. 
you could have heard the same advice at a different stage and and went out and drank you just, you were ready to hear it then yeah. yeah so when was the last time you had a drink over 15 years ago jesus yeah yeah 15 and a half same years with ago. narcotics yeah is that what na stands for na narcotics anonymous yeah yeah 15 years ago yeah so what's it like now for you living in ireland now Al it's alcohol advertised everywhere yeah now it's i don't even see it you know what i mean it's very much i've moved on from it massively like, i don't even remember what it's like to be drunk and any time like for me the dangerous time for me sorry i'll go back to your question okay it was difficult back when i was younger i'm older now got a girlfriend got a daughter you know i've, I've moved on I don't feel the need to party every weekend. I don't feel the need to go out. When I was younger, when I was in my early 20s, that was, it was hard at times. One thing my mom did when I came out of treatment center is she opened up a bottle of wine and had a glass of wine. Right? Some people lock drink cabinets, hide the drink away, you know, don't have the temptation. There was addiction in my family. So my parent, my mom kind of knew how to deal with addiction and, you know, um, so she was like, you're going to have to deal with this for the rest of your life. You're going to have to drink for the rest, you know, you're going to be around drink. You're going to be around alcohol. So you might as well be around it with the people closest to you and get used to it because you're very young. And, you know, if you try hide from drink, it's going to be harder. Um, so I didn't hide from it. I actually went and got a job in a bar. <laughs> Did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I worked in bars for, for years. Yeah, I've always worked in bars, um, just straight in the deep end because I, I had a purpose to be in the bar. Mm. It's very difficult to be in a bar with, a, you know, with a, a sparkling water in your hand. And I don't know what to do with my hands and I don't know, you know, I don't want to talk about. And then and that's grand for the first couple of hours when people are generally kind of sober. But then it gets a little bit later and people, you're hearing the same story again and again and again. And your ear is getting wetter and wetter and wetter. And you're like, oh, fuck, I, like, I don't need to be here, you know. Um, so, yeah, and I, I, I always knew that the point when to leave. You know what I mean? So I always kind of went, my head's wrecked now. You know, don't stick around just for the sake of sticking around and be brave and look at me, I can stay in a bar and not drink. Get out now. You know, get out when you can get out. So it was very difficult for a couple of years. Um, I remember the first time going to a festival, I nearly had a meltdown. Like I had to just leave straight away. Like everyone was off their tits, was people curled up in balls on the ground, you know, jaws all over the place. And then I could feel it. Like I could feel my, like butterflies in my stomach. Do you know what I mean? I was like, oh my God, like that guy's curled up in a ball on the grass, but he is having the time of his life. And I felt all of that. And I was like, shit, I need to get out of here. And I got out, you know what I mean? I got out, I was very lucky I got out quick. Um, but I went back to a festival again. Because I enjoy house music, I enjoy dance music, and I wanted to be able to experience it. Hmm. And I do, and I go to like, and it's, you know, I don't really go to them much anymore, but you know, I've been to some of the biggest festivals in the world and I've had the time of my life. And people have said to me, you know, you not need to take drugs to them. I'm like, those festivals, you don't need to take drugs. They're the ones you don't need to take drugs going to. Because the music is so good, the setup is so good, it's clean, there's nice food there. You know, there's a pool, there's a swimming pool, like, you mm. know, like or, or a sauna, stuff like that, you know. Um, did you follow the 12 step program? I did. Yeah, very much so. Do you still follow any of those steps? I do not as not as, you know, as as strongly as I used to. So I went to meetings religiously for about five years, five, six years, like five, six times a week, like lived it like breathe it like everything and then like i kind of have the tools ingrained into me now that i don't go to meetings every day I, like i actually to be honest i very rarely go to a meeting i go to a meeting when things are really really good oh yeah that's a very dangerous time for me <clears throat> because i can forget how bad it was because things are so good. That's how, that's when I took the first beer. Things were really good. I was in Crete, the sun was shining. I had built up all these, I said it, they're nice relationships. Things were really good. I can have a beer. When things are bad, like I know that by taking a drug or drinking, it's just gonna make it worse. I know what it's like when you wake up the next day with all those problems and a head full of fucking come down. You know what I mean? That's not a good place for me. Mm. But when I'm really good, that's when I'm like, you need to go to a meet now, you need to be careful. You know what I mean? Don't get carried away. You know, 
remember what it was like you go into a meeting you sit down you hear a guy i remember when i was over in london and i went to a meeting and i was 12 years off everything at the time and a guy came in and he was 12 years off everything he just had a slip and he was rattled absolutely rattled shaking in the seat and i just thought i need to be here right now I need to see this. I need to know that it's just like, it's around the corner for me if I need it. It's there like, a fella said to me one time, he's like, your addiction is at the bottom of your bed doing press ups, waiting for you to slip up. It just wants you, it wants you to like, you know, it's there like, it's always there. And all you need to do is slip up and you're gone, you know? Um, so yeah, so I don't go, but, but yeah. And then, and, and then when I started teaching yoga, and then started looking into the philosophy of yoga and you know i very much thought the philosophy of yoga is very much like the 12 steps of aa and really? you know and yeah and it's try to live a better life mm. you know try to be kind to people you know like you know one of the steps is like a conscious contact with god and meditation like you know like there's a lot of meditation and like i know god isn't in yoga sorry i don't want to bring religion into to yoga but it's a god of your understanding you know what i mean i felt like i i struggled massively with that i'm not a religious person so when god came into it i was like whoa hold up a second now you know not for me not for me sorry and a guy was like man god can be the lamp post if you think the lamp post is going to make you better let god be the lamp post you know what I mean? It's anything that's going to make you better, you know? Um, so yeah, there was a lot of meditation in there. There was a lot of checking in with yourself. Like I go to bed every night, I lie down in the bed and I, I, I'm very grateful for what I've got in my life right now. Hmm. I check in. What could I have done better today? You know, did I have an argument with somebody? Can I pick up the phone tomorrow and apologize to somebody? You know, things like that, just checking in, waking up in the morning, open my eyes, I'm sober. Things are really good. I've got a warm bed. Like those small little tiny things, like, like from lying in somebody else's bed that's not clean at a party and trying to get sleep and how disgusting and horrible you feel. Just having a warm bed is magic to me. Mm. Magic, you know what I mean? Um, and having the people that I have in my life, the support that I've been given by the people around me. What's your relationship like with your parents now? Amazing. Like, and um, like, you know, anything that I've ever wanted to do. And I've like, I've thrown a lot of things in, in like, you know, I, switch and change jobs quite a lot you know when i'm not like i don't really settle into something not that i change like i i stay with the things but i move around if i if there's something that comes into my head and i decide i want to do it i go and do it and my parents have never ever stopped me from doing anything like deciding to be an actor like most parents would be like whoa no the arts there's no money there you know <laughs> don't do it my mom was like do it do it mm. go for it i'm thinking about doing this go for it I'm thinking about doing yoga teacher training. Go for it. Do it now. Have you got the money for it? Is there anything we can do to support you? Mm. Always there. Um, my relation with my dad is my dad is like the go to person. He's the voice of reason, mm. not just for me, with the family, you know. Um, so, yeah, I have a, a, an amazing relationship with my parents. You said you have addiction in your family. You don't, I don't expect you to say who. Uh, but what what did that look like? Yeah, so I suppose the the one that I kind of the, the, my dad had a, had drink problems. He doesn't drink anymore. My grandfather was a a big member of AA in Limerick for a long time. He was a very well sp spoken about man. After being an alcoholic himself. Yeah, so he was an alcoholic, and then he he went into AA and he helped a lot of people in AA for a lot of right. for a long time. Um, and even when I went into meetings in NAP, he's, I'd hear his name popping up. You know what oh, I mean? I'd be wow. like, oh, yeah, you, you know, such and such helped me. And um, and I'd be like, oh, that's my grandfather. And um, so he helped a lot of people. Um, so it was just, it was it was there. It was in my family. Um, 
it's in a lot of Irish families. A lot of it's in a lot of families, you it's, know, not it's just a, it's Irish, a, but everywhere, you know. Like, and there's there's definitely a, a culture of it being okay to drink the way people drink. Mm. Um, and then, like, it's just a hard. It's it's a really difficult one. I think with drink because some people can drink every day and not be an alcoholic or not have a problem with it. It might be one drink at the end of the day. But they get up in the morning, they don't feel okay, they're the same person, they're kind to the people around them, they go to work, they do their jobs, you know, but they drink every day. And some people might drink once a week and get absolutely hammered on a Friday night, we'll say. They're rattled all day Saturday, they're not feeling the best Sunday. They go into work feeling like shit Monday morning. They're not kind to their, you know, their colleagues in work. They're not kind to their partners, their family. Because of that, you know, that binge they had on a Friday night. Mm. So if you, like, I mean, you could say to somebody, you're drinking every day, you're an alcoholic. Well, I only drink once a week, so I'm not an alcoholic. But who's got the problem? Do you know what I mean? The person that's drinking once a week or the person that's drinking every day. You know, so it's it's, a it's your relationship with it. It's the relationship it's why you're with drinking. it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, my dad, alcoholic for twenty years, um, and now doesn't drink at all. And I wonder how much genetics plays a role in how predisposed you are to addiction, because his brother. It's the same, but much, much more severe. Um, the father wouldn't class as an alcoholic, but drank a lot. The mother, it's hard to say really. I mean, they drank all the time. A lot, sorry, not all the time. But um, you could have two brothers. They have a father that's an alcoholic. One brother sees that as the way out or the way of life. The other sees that as, as the trap it is. They see their father degenerating health-wise they see the destruction it does for everyone around them and they don't drink at all uh, but for me and by the way if you say your dad's an alcoholic it or was an alcoholic it makes it people instantly will be like oh god's poor you but the thing is you can be an alcoholic um like his brother was very destructive uh physically and in, in, in other ways but my dad was the opposite my dad uh, it was like um i felt for him you know i could see that he was trapped by this and I didn't feel resentment. I felt sorrow. And I, I think it made me realize that we're, try, we're always trying to, well, we sometimes try to escape something. And uh, I, I mean, like, I get on really well with him, so well now. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, you, you hear like p people speaking of trauma, but I think that sometimes that weight or that toughness you can experience when you're younger, it can make you more resilient it, it, or it could break you equally. I, I do think though, the people around you often decide if it makes or breaks you. You know, if you don't have, uh, if you have people around you that support you and that show you that, look, this person's drinking, not because they're a bad person. <clears throat> Sorry, not because they're a bad person, but it's because they're suffering they need to feel a connection to something and this is the easiest way and especially men of that generation it wasn't the thing to speak about your feelings um and although i'm i'm kind of uncomfortable with the the idea of like men's circles and men really really sharing it's funny it makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable and I, I said before, actually, in a previous podcast, and I, I kind of regret saying this, I said it's like a bunch of people sitting around bitching. And I, I actually would like to retract that because that was a bit unfair to say that. That's me reflecting to say that I don't find it useful to talk to endlessly about what I experienced growing up because I, the bottom line is I had a great childhood, a fantastic childhood, a fantastic mum and dad, sister, um, and I don't demonize alcohol. It's just, you, we have to recognize that sometimes we're all suffering about something and we choose some things to medicate that. It could be alcohol, it could be food, it could be shopping on Amazon. It could be um, trying to make out that your social media life is your real life 
and you're basically trying to anesthetize if that's the word if i can say it um something that what you're lacking and it's not that you're a bad person or even weak for doing that but it's to recognize that you are doing it and uh Without, without trivializing this whole conversation, I do that through sugar. <laughs> I'm a sugar fiend. Yep. So saying to you downstairs, you know, you came up and said, uh, do you have any sugar? We had, it was like a panic. We we're like, do we have sugar in the house? Oh no, this man needs a sugar for his coffee. Because we don't keep sugar. We, we, I don't even know where it is in the house because if I have biscuits in there, I'll eat the whole packet. Yep. And again, this is not like this is nothing compared to what you've experienced. So I don't mean to trivialize it, but it is a case of like, why are you eating Kev? Why are you eating this shit? Basically, it's because you're trying to comfort yourself. Um, you're lacking something, and often it's just what I'm lacking is I need to get outside. I need to go for a run. I need to do some yoga. I need to um, I don't know ha have sex or whatever with rage. Um, but it's much easier to find that comfort in something that's like like. Alcohol. Yeah, and you're saying there about trivializing it and, and, you know, like talking about sugar versus drugs and stuff like that. I, I For me, sugar's just as bad. I have woke up with worse hangovers from from sugar. Like now, like that is the thing that, that gets me now is sugar. Like if I, like, if the neighbours come over, right, we, we just go on a binge on a Friday night. They come over every Friday night, we get takeaway, we eat chocolate, we eat sweets, everything, right? And I teach a class on a Saturday morning and mo like Saturday mornings, I wake up like I've got a hangover. <laughs> the sugar hangover. It's just the sugar hangover. I'm lying in the bed going, oh my God, like I feel terrible. And it's from sugar. Like I heard a story years ago that like, I, I like did this, I don't know if this story is true or anything, but it was. Never I, let the truth get in the way of a good story. Right, yeah, yeah. And, and it was like where, you know, pirates went off to some place where there was cocaine and there was sugar, right? And they were leaving and they wanted to take something with them. They left the cocaine and they took the sugar because the sugar was more addictive. Apparently- That's the, like, old, the old pirate sugar cocaine yeah, tale. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because like, and I'm, like I'm, I'm crucifying that story, you know what I mean? But I'm not sure what the actual story was, but like it just like our tolerance to sugar now is way higher than what it ever was way back when when they discovered sugar do you know what i mean so maybe they were getting the same high from sugar back then as what they were maybe if they brought cocaine we'd all be like really tolerant to cocaine these days you know we'd all be snorting <laughs> sugar in the, in the yeah, coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. um but uh i i actually think the biggest addiction i face at the moment if, sorry i'm going to park sugar to one side is social media is, is or even just my phone it's just i know this isn't news to anyone but um I really, I really believe that it's destroying society. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a handy thing to have, but it's, it's destroying society and the fabric of it, and also our ability to be uh, effective human beings, um, and uh, that we should all recognise that it can be useful for certain things. That's my sweeping statement about about social media. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's a very difficult one, isn't it? I mean, it really is. You haven't like, found your addiction to transferred over to that? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Like there's times where, like, yeah, I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is pick up my phone, you know? And there's stages where I go through where I charge my phone now out in the living room, leave mm. the doors open and have the alarm on from the living room. So then I, like, it's two things. Is one is I don't look at the phone straight away when I wake up. And number two is I have to get out of the bed when the alarm rings because I need to, you know, I need to turn it off. Do I do that now? Did I do that this morning? No. You know what I mean? But I go through stages of it. I recognize it and I go through stages of it. Um, but like I fall back, like, I mean, we all, like, I don't know, I won't say we all, I'll say I, I fall back into those traps all the time. Um, and yeah, like social media, it's like, I pick, I pick up my phone now and I don't even know why I picked up my phone. Oh yeah. Like 100%. I went to Google to, 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 to search something and then Google has something like, you know, I don't know, but Germany beat England last night. And then I click into Germany beating, beating England last night. Or sorry, England beating Germany last night. Mm. And, and then I'm stuck in that and I'm reading that. And then I'm like, what, what the fuck did I come in here for? I go to my toilet, not to go to the toilet, to check my phone. Yeah. And then I go, I'm in the toilet now, I must have a wee. Yeah. And I worry because I have a nine month old daughter and you've got a 21 year old daughter. <laughs> um, so I worry for her. I mean, Luckily, I live. I mean, I don't live on my own, because when you live with someone, 
they hold you accountable. Yeah. I've, if I'm on my phone and Rach walks in the room, I put the phone down because I feel kind of embarrassed that I'm on the phone for no reason. Yeah. Um, therefore, when I'm at home working, I'm on my laptop. It's supposed to be, I could do stuff on my phone, but I'm on my laptop. So it's like, right, the, I, mean, I can't really scroll. It's not the same thing. It doesn't give that instant gratification. So Rach holds me accountable. She'll come in the room. I'll put the phone down. If I'm with Eve, I, all right. Firstly, they say you shouldn't judge. No, that's not, right. well, you probably shouldn't, but we, we ain't perfect. I notice what other parents do. And I notice parents like on their phone with their kid, and I was in the Botanic Gardens recently, walking through there, and um, I'm judging because I'm trying, I'm not saying they're a bad parent, but I'm saying that's bad parenting. Yeah. In the Botanic Gardens, this guy's five yards in front of us, and he's with his daughter, she's probably five or six, and he's a middle-aged man. He, for 45 minutes, he did not look up from his phone once and she did not look up from her phone once. So for the first five minutes that I noticed it happening and I look at her age and she's not really paying attention. I'm, I was going to pass comment. I thought, no, Kev, don't pass comment. You know, you're not perfect. This geezer, you look at his phone. You look at your phone all the time with he sometimes there as well, right? I thought maybe he's checking. But f Shane, 45 minutes. Now, it may sound like I'm going on about this a lot, but I look at that and I imprint it into my mind and I go, if I find myself doing that, I fucked up. I've, 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 uh, I'm, I haven't had any awareness about my parenting, and uh, I've seen this time and time again. Like the kid is screaming in the pram, and the parent just hands them the phone, or they just look at the phone instead of looking at the kid. And uh, I don't really care what people think about my opinion here. That's wrong. You shouldn't be doing that. And if I, everyone ever sees me out doing that, um, I'm in the wrong. <laughs> completely yeah that that is it's, it's a fair point um and i don't think that people parents should be handing their children kids but but at the same time it's very difficult to be a parent this right? is uh, this nothing thing and if, if, she's if, nine months she's not doing she's basically just a bundle and yeah, she makes you're not noise. Be handing her a phone yeah, no but i'm not saying it's like she hasn't she's very easy to manage <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so what I'm, I suppose I should be asking is, as they as the kids get older, I imagine you need more tools to Ab absolutely do the parenting. I have a cousin with four kids, and they're all oh, they're, they're all within it. Like they're all very close together. I think there's like two years between them or something like that. Now that's like that's mayhem, right? How can you like? Of course, at some point during the day, you're going to have to go. My brain needs a break here. Please take the take the tablet, take the phone because I need my sanity for a couple of minutes here. Mm. And if your own sanity. Is more important than giving a child a phone or a tablet for a couple of sec for, for a minute or two or half an hour, whatever hell you want to give the child the phone or the tablet for who knows, they might learn something on the tablet. You know, mm. maybe there's something educational on that tablet, you know, and I know like we're, we're in a world where, you know, yes, it is very much and it's a very difficult thing to, to talk about. But I just think coming from a selfish program of addiction, yeah, number one is most important. And if you need as in you are, most you, are, you are most important, because if I'm not good in my head or if I'm not right or if a parent isn't right in their head, what good is what good is the relationship with the child? How are they going to be able to look after the child? You know I mean, how are they going to give the child the, the love that they need if they're angry or if they're 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 really cross? Yeah, or the same thing, angry, cross, whatever it is. I would prefer to see a child, a, a parent hand a child a tablet and go and sit in a space for five minutes, 10 minutes and breathe than to get angry at the child and give out to the child. Yeah, I, I guess the thing is, I'm talking about um, being a parent, but to a nine month old. And I think this yeah. is the key here. Yeah. I may turn around in two years and go, yeah, exactly. You, Do you know what I said two years will, ago? Yeah, you will have a job. Yeah. You will, like, you'll be like, she's, that, she's downstairs now on a virtual reality machine. Peppa Pig, get it on. Yeah. They love it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I know. And actually, um, I'm glad I've actually talked this out with you because it has made me reflect that like, as soon as I said that, I'm like, well, hold on. She's only nine months. And what's going to happen in two or three years? The other thing is growing up in the eighties, watching tv gave you cultural references that are important for your social development like for example i referenced he-man 
what hap- what would happen if you grew up in the 80s and never watched TV? You wouldn't know who He-Man was. Yeah. And they, therefore, socially, you, you can't make those cultural references. Yeah, I think the difference is when you watch the TV, the TV's not watching you. When you look at your phone, it's look examine your habits yeah. and it's wanting to keep you on there more. Um, I suppose it's it's just it's a case of I, I, I'm re- refining your your methods. But yeah, and it's like we're the old people now. Excuse me. Yeah, but like you know, let's be real about this. Do you know what I mean? We're like, I'm thirty nine and a half. Yeah, I'm, and I'm younger than you. You're <laughs> older than me. <laughs> but like. We're, we're, not, we're not old, do you know what I mean? But we're of an older generation. You know what I mean? Where we watch TV and and kids watch, they, they play with phones. You know what I mean? Let's not be the cranky old men going, oh, you don't spend <laughs> enough time on the on the thing. Let's move with the times, you know? Hmm. Let's, because like the, these are the times we live in. Do we want to sit stagnant and, and be the cranky old men? Or do we want to go, okay, well, this is the way the world is now. Let's move forward with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yes, like, if I sit here and be cranky about a kid being on a phone, who, who's, I'm not trying to change the world. I'm just going to be angry, at, you know, because I'm judging somebody else. Yeah. Or else just go, okay, that's the way the world is now. Let's move forward with that. I probably won't make the decision to do that, but, you know, that's the way the world is and accept it and move forward and then, you know, you know, ask questions and why and like you know all that kind of stuff yeah you, know? you might yeah. yeah i think i think my philosophy is going to be and my strategy is going to be treat it like alcohol like if you go to france 14 year olds sitting at the table will have a glass of wine yeah. but for, for us when we're young it's like oh alcohol is what you do when you're an adult when you're free yeah. when and so i i start smoking when i'm young i start drinking young because it, it accelerates me into adulthood yeah. also so that one is actually the how you how you uh is not banishing something because it's what makes someone want, want it more but the other thing as you said is to kind of ask the questions oh what are you up to on your phone what are you doing maybe um and to try and understand it because instead of banishing something you should make the alternative more appealing so i could say sweetheart you go on your phone you can do or we go to the botanic gardens and you like those flowers you go see those flowers as opposed and therefore hopefully the alternative to her is more appealing and also maybe not don't make it an ultimatum like jonathan height who has a book called the coddling of the american mind and he also has a lecture online about it uh, which i watch on youtube on my phone <laughs> Shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. um is um he talks about with his kids he's kind of quite what's the word radical in how he raises kids he will give his kids two hours of the day to use this iPad or smartphone and he has a clock on it. So once the two hours is up, it's disabled. They can't use it anymore. So they know when they do use it, they've got to make use of the time. Yeah. Max, uh, you know, maximize the productivity over the one doing it. The other thing he does is he has, <laughs> he lets his like nine year old walk the streets of New York. So like, honey, you want to go down the shop and get some bread? No worries. Do what you want to do. And he doesn't supervise them, lets them go off. Now, they have a phone with them, <laughs> so he can actually track where they are. And essentially, this is to counter what's become helicopter parenting, knowing where your kid is all the time. Yep. And uh, and actually, this, this, this helicopter parenting, which is becoming more and more prevalent because we think the world is scarier than it is, where it's actually as safe as it's, it's ever been. Exactly. And, and, and I think Blind Boy talked about that in a podcast once. Oh, really? Time. Yeah. And it was like, the, the world is actually a safer place mm. for kids. But because of like, I think it was the introduction of 24 hour news that we started to believe that that the world was a dangerous place because we're watching this news all the time mm-hmm. of all the danger and all the bad things that are going on in the world. So now we're like, I'm not even kid outside the door anymore. Yeah. You mean, I went to, I left the door, I, I walked out the door at eight o'clock in the morning and I came back 10 o'clock that evening. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I roamed the streets, I went swimming down, you know, jumping off cliffs and jumping into pools and all that stuff down the West of Clare. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And there was never any problems. Yeah. You mean, I came back for food. You know, <laughs> like a feral, it. yeah, and, feral and, child. Yeah, and gone again. You know what I mean? <laughs> and they were the most amazing times of my life. I'll never forget those memories. Yeah. You know, there's actually uh, I, you've got a green outside your house right yeah when i was growing up that that green was full of kids mm. yeah there's actually a link between helicopter parenting that generation and those kids then when they become adults they're more willing to accept authoritarian regimes which is interesting that 
I, I'm self-employed, you're self-employed. I find that people in our walk of life who, who don't, who are self-employed and you do a few different roles, um, they're more, for want of a better word, free thinkers, as it were. Where it seems like a lot of, and we're going to a different topic here slightly, but a lot of the society now is kind of willing to just accept whatever they're told and just follow the rules, do what the powers may be, say, and everything will be fine. And it's just very interesting to see, like, the, as we sit here in June 2021, how that is, people are starting to kind of reconsider what they hear and, you know. Yeah, there's very much, there's very Tim Ford hats on. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, chem clouds is a big, like, there's all like, that I, stuff. Yeah, I wasn't like, going that far. Yeah, like, I mean, but like, you know, it's all that stuff is going on. And, and yes, like, I like, I mean, what on the flat on this flat Earth is going on, eh? Yeah, crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know. Yeah. That's my joke. But like, at least somebody's asking the question. Yeah. You know, am I going to be a person asking a question? No, I won't. Am I okay with somebody asking a question? Absolutely. Please ask all the questions. The more mm. questions, the better. Mm. You know, I'm I'm happy. I've had my struggles, and I'm really happy with where my life is right now. And I'm, you know, mm. so I'm okay here. You know. What's your focus now then, like as in, like in the short future? In short, sh short, short future, that's a long terminology. Short term future. The short term future. Like, Hopefully I'm, the future is not short. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a very early in my in my um, yoga teaching career. So like very much my, fa my focus now is trying to educate myself as best I can so that I can teach it as best I can. I don't want to just go in and tell somebody to do something in their body and not know why I'm doing it or not know what, why they're doing that. You know what I mean? So I try to educate myself as much as I can, online immersions, online workshops, all that kind of stuff is very much my short-term focus at the moment, is, mm. you know, is to educate myself as best I can with this, you know? And um, we were just talking about, so it's interrupt, but Yogi Brian. Yeah. Uh, you you bought, bought his, um, you kind of first person to tell me about him and it's just really interesting if you're a yoga teacher listening to this um like i've been doing it for four and a half years five years maybe and you tend to you live in dublin you do your training in dublin you're 200 hour you're 300 hour you um go to different classes but everyone's kind of done similar trainings so your focus your it's like you're looking you have tunnel vision in your ability to teach you say similar cues to everyone else, um, similar format, the way you speak is similar to other people. But then you, someone like Yogi Brian, for example, comes in, uh, is uh, Brian with a Y, by the way, if you're looking at him online. And I'm like, what the hell, this guy, he does like meditations that are like, uh, go unfuck yourself or something like that, yeah, or like, don't give a fuck meditation. Yeah, like we talked about his merchandise, it's just fucking yoga. Do you know what I mean? That's his slogan. Yeah, that's his slogan. Yeah, it's like it's it's just fucking yoga, chill, like. Yeah, and and initially I'm like, oh, that's a bit edgy, but um, it makes you realise there's loads of ways to do anything, and uh, it's very encouraging when you like the God bless the internet that we can actually have teachers that have completely different styles and uh, d different formats to the class, and to understand that in this craft, as you said, you kind of alluded to at the start. You will go to a class sometimes, and I used this, and it'd be like, I would love to do this actually. What this person's doing, and uh, it's just the way they did this, that, they, the way they did this this way, and how the people reacted to that, and how I feel, and this, that. and I could do this for a living. And then you start um, it, coming across people like, say, Yogi Brian, who even teaches meditations in, in a way you wouldn't think of. Yep. And for me, it's it's exciting. I'm like, wow, there's there's loads of ways you can evolve and keep going. Because the worst thing you can do in any profession is become stale and be, get bored. Yeah. As I heard Joe Rogan say once, he wishes that he could live a hundred lifetimes because there's so much to do, you know? Yeah. Um, so I'd say check out Yogi Brian um, and also check out Shane Lennon as well. <laughs> yeah. Shane, Shane we, we're going to wrap this because it'd be an hour, but where would people find you, man? Instagram. I mean, I, I haven't posted in a while now. You know, I had hey, that, come on. Yeah, yeah, I know. I need to get back on it. Uh, <laughs> people might you know, shame with his top off and his tattoos. Hey. Very much of your eye. Uh, <laughs> Here you say it so many times. You want to see top off? You want to see tattoos? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> um, and look, if it catches somebody's attention and they they read something that, that and I try to share stuff, experiences that I've had 
on my page. Do you know what I mean? I try not to, to go in, you know, I try not to share anything that I don't know too much about um, if I've experienced it and, you know, I can share it. And sometimes it's, it's, it's hard stuff. It's not, it doesn't come second nature to me. Social media, you know, my girlfriend has definitely been a, a good, strong influence. Like you need to post, you need to get content. You know what I mean? She helps me a lot with that kind of stuff. Um, I'm pretty sure that's bullying, but go on. Yeah, yeah, just a lot of <laughs> yeah she's definitely the boss. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you can find me on Instagram, uh, Shane Lennon Yoga. Uh, yeah, and and I always say to people as well, if there's anything like, like I'm not a counselor, I'm not, you know, I'm I'm not a psychotherapist, nothing like that. Um, you know, but if there's anything that came up in the podcast, and you feel free, like feel free to get in touch with me, if there's anything I can help with, I like helping people. You know what I mean? It's just it's, I think it's a human thing. We like helping others, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Shane, man, thank you. That was unbelievable. Cheers, I really man. appreciate you, you coming, much. and thank hopefully you. we'll do it again. Great. Thank you. This episode was brought to you by Move, Meditate, Sleep, an all-in-one platform to help you move more freely, meditate more easily, and sleep more soundly, with new content added every week. If you'd like to try a free seven-day trial, click the link in the pinned comment below.